Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Melissa Begg, and I have the great honor of serving as the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. Today, we're delighted to welcome a distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Tanya Sharp, to deliver the Hyman and Sophie Grossbard Lecture in Psychotherapy and Social Work Practice. The Hyman and Sophie Grossbard Lecture honors two committed graduates of the Columbia School of Social Work. Its intent is to focus on addressing and advancing our understanding and knowledge base for direct practice and clinical social work. And we're thrilled that Dr. Sharp has agreed to deliver today's lecture. I'm grateful for this opportunity for our community to come together and to hear from Dr. Sharp and to better understand the impact of homicide on black communities and about coping strategies for surviving the aftermath of loss and trauma. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight's moderator, my amazing colleague, Dr. Desmond Patton. Dr. Patton is Professor of Social Work and Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Curriculum Innovation here at CSSW. Dr. Patton's research interrogates pathways to violence, both online and offline, in unique ways. He takes an innovative approach using qualitative and computational data methods to study how and why violence grief and identity are expressed on social media and the impact these expressions have on well-being among low-income youth of color. Dr. Patton is a member of Columbia's Data Science Institute and in 2020 he was appointed as its inaugural Associate Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And at our school Dr. Patton plays a number of really critical leadership roles uh, as well as leading exciting initiatives including the Safe Lab, AI for All, the Action Lab for Social Justice, and too many others to name. Uh, and last month, I will add, we were delighted to learn that Dr. Patton has been invited to serve on the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences Committee on Scientific Freedom and Responsibility, a committee with a long history of focusing on scientific freedom and responsibility in a global context. Dr. Patton, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, but I am more excited to welcome uh, Dr. Tanya Sharp to Columbia and to our broader community. Um, Dr. Sharp has been um, a colleague and a friend for a number of years, and I have learned immensely from her work over the last few years. So I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to introduce her and to uh, learn from her tonight. Uh, Dr. Sharp is a community engaged researcher who is passionately committed to the development of innovative approaches and sustainable opportunities allowing Black communities to thrive following the traumatic devastation of homicide. Her research examines social cultural factors that influence the coping strategies of Black family members and friends of homicide victims. She has developed culturally appropriate interventions designed to assist African American survivors of homicide victims in the management of their grief and bereavement. Her comprehensive model of coping for African American survivors of homicide victims has informed the development of a psychosocial educational intervention and the first tool of measurement designed to assess the needs and coping strategies of African American survivors of homicide victims. Dr. Sharp is the endowed chair in social work in the global community and the founder of, and the director of the Center for Research and Innovation for Black Survivors of Homicide Victims, the CRIB a multidisciplinary initiative designed to advance research, policy and practice for, for and with Black survivors of homicide victims throughout our global community. Without further ado, Dr. Sharp, welcome. Thank you so, so very much, uh, Dr. Patton. I, I think I might hire you to, to make our future announcements for the crib. Um, uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And also uh, thank you, uh, Dean Begg, for uh, inviting me to, uh, share with you some of my research um, uh, for this evening's lecture. So without further ado, let me attempt to share my screen. Ignore the background. It's a wonderful picture of South Africa, one of the very, very dear places that I love to visit. So, all right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Tanya Sharp. And as mentioned, I'm an associate professor at the Factor and Winnetosh Faculty of Social Work. And for the past, 20 years, I've been developing a program of research for and in collaboration with Black surviving family members and friends of homicide victims. A topic that has real world implications to spaces and places throughout the globe. Chicago, Illinois, Johannesburg, South Africa, Kingston, Jamaica, Baltimore, Maryland, Toronto, Canada, 
and right here in New York. In short, no one is immune. But I'll circle back to that in a moment. Before I begin, I think it's important that you understand what drew me to this work, my calling, if you will. Before entering grad school, I was working at the Harvard School of Public Health, Division of Public Health Practice, working side by side with families and friends who are surviving the homicide of a loved one. I was working with them for the purpose of developing violence prevention programs. And it was during that time that I met Edna. And when I met Edna, well, Edna's son had just been murdered. A bunch of us who worked with Edna attended the funeral to pay our respects. I entered the church and as I approached Edna, I extended my hand and said, I'm so sorry for your loss. Edna looked at me with disdain and said, I didn't lose my son. He was taken from me. Her words, her words struck me. They struck me to my very core. And it was in that moment, that exact moment, I knew I was called to do this work. In that moment, two things became abundantly clear. If I, as a trained social worker, even with the best of intentions, did not know how to help her, to assist her, to comfort or support her, how equipped would other service providers be? I also thought about the fact that and wonder how would Edna cope with the murder of her son? Now Edna's story is not unlike the surviving mom whose son had just been murdered one month prior to my meeting her after delivering the keynote address at the inaugural Survivors of Homicide Victims Conference here in Toronto, Canada. And all I could do was hold the space for her pain. A few years back on a trip to Boston, I saw Edna again and I ran over to her with excitement. I wanted to tell her that I kept my promise that through my work, I'm uplifting the voices, the voices of so many who feel voiceless. That familiar weight of sadness clouded her eyes and she grabbed my hand and said, Tanya, I'm so glad because my son Leonard, Edna's youngest son was murdered last year. Time is running out, she said, and we need you. So I'm very clear that the work that I do is in service to them. The survivors whose wounds are not visible to the naked eye, but in the absence of culturally responsive interventions are left to fester and often never heal. Now I wanna provide some context relevant to homicide throughout our global community. On average, each year, 17,000 murders occur in the United States. And what you'll hear many people say is that compared to other forms of violent crime, that number's fairly low. However, when you think about who the majority of homicide victims are, young black men and women living in urban areas. When you realize that although African-Americans make up roughly 13% of the US population, and yet they account for more than half of homicide victims. And when you understand that on average, African-Americans experience the homicide of a loved one at least two times in their lifetime, you begin to realize that we are dealing with an epidemic that disproportionately impacts some of our most vulnerable. Now this overrepresentation of black 
homicide victims is not unique to the United States. On average, 600 murders occur in Canada each year. And out of the 13 provinces and territories, the numbers of homicide is often highest in Ontario. In 2019, Stats Canada released data indicating that racialized populations accounted for 75% of homicide victims in Ontario, 44% of whom identified as African Caribbean Black. On average in Jamaica, Jamaicans experience Jamaican citizens experience 1,500 murders each year, nine times the global rate. On average in South Africa, South Africans experience 18,000 murders each year, seven times the global rate. Now, the numbers alone don't allow for us to see that for Black people, our relationship to one another extends far beyond blood ties and country borders. So the ripple effect and impact of homicide is far reaching, suggesting that the number of family members and friends is far greater than research predicts. In addition, when we consider the frequency in which homicide occurs in black communities throughout the global diaspora, the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, Africa, Brazil, you begin to understand that we are dealing with a disproportionate number of black people who are struggling to make sense out of that, which is senseless. The numbers alone, devoid of both social and cultural context, contribute to gaps in research, policy and practice, often allowing for false narratives to be made about the causes and consequences of experiencing the homicide of a loved one for black communities, resulting in mistrust in formal institutions such as universities, the police, mental and medical health care services. Now, Redmond and Doka suggest that on average, each homicide victim each homicide victim has seven to 10 family members and friends who must learn how to survive the homicide of the loved one. But when we think about the ripple effect, that number is far greater than research predicts. I want us to take a moment to really understand the disproportionate reality of homicide for black people. Specifically, I want you to think about who black survivors of homicide victims are. They are your clients, your peers, your students, our military, your, your child's coach, your mechanic, your colleagues, the pilot that offers self landing from your last vacation, your grocery store clerk, your family, your children's friends. They are people you come in contact with every day who look just like me. They are your Edna's. They might even be you. So it is with this understanding of who they are and how we are all impacted we are better positioned to not only understand the prevalence of cumulative black death, but we begin to comprehend the traumatic pandemic of grief that disproportionately impacts and devastates black communities. With this understanding, we are better informed about ways we might support and intervene. Now you may be thinking, as tragic as homicide is, I can't relate to the Black experience. Or perhaps you're thinking that the subject matter is not related to your area of research. I want us to take a moment to think about that. Really think about that. When we consider the a plethora of systems and services that survivors of homicide victims engage with on a daily basis, as well as the ones they need and interact with, 
as a result of experiencing the murder of a loved one. Social work, medical and mental public health care systems, education, law, justice, criminology, and sociolegal services, public policy, technology, engineering, data science, faith-based institutions, global affairs, sociology, you begin to understand that you, you as teachers, researchers, emerging scholars, policymakers, and developers for these professions, you play a pivotal role in what should and could be a global response to this unacknowledged and under-researched pandemic of grief. What we may, must also keep in mind is that Black people are not only grieving the pervasive murder of family members and friends on a global scale, but they are also experiencing collective trauma as a result of seeing the constant brutal erasure of us over social media streams played over and over and over again. This chronic exposure to cumulative black death, wherein even if you are not related to the victim, you see yourself. You see your sons, your daughters, your brothers and sisters in these images. This collective trauma contributes to the grief of our humanity our safety at pandemic proportions, and it does something to you. It shatters one's soul. These individual and collective experiences of homicide impact the mental and physical and spiritual being, and dare I say the souls of black survivors of homicide victims, leading to a ubiquity of injustice that complicates and disenfranchises their ability to grieve. If by chance a murder is captured on video, we wait, we wait, we wait with bated breath for the perpetrators to be brought to trial and convicted, holding out for some shred of acknowledgement and recognition that we have the right to jog while black, drive while black, order coffee while black, talk on a cell phone while black, enter your dorm room while black, bird watch while black, eat ice cream in your own home while black, breathe while Black. We experience the ubiquity of injustice, not only in the collective viewing of our demise, or during trials where anti-Black racism is often the 13th juror, but also the manner in which reporting the prevalence of Black homicide is not acknowledged due to the lack of race-based data collection, as is in the case here in Canada or when race-based data on homicide is available, such as it is in the US, absent from the discussion is the overrepresentation of black homicides, particularly as it pertains to black women, trans women, et cetera. When we think about the systematic way anti-Black racism permeates the very fabric of our society, infecting like a relentless virus of violent inequity. Those structures that Black people rely upon for their survival. We have a responsibility to take action. This is where 
the foundation, the framework of my research began. And so in the next few slides, as we positioned ourselves in this central framework of understanding the disproportionate reality of homicide for uh, black communities, I want to, to walk you through um, sort of what led me to this work. Again, those experiences with, with Edna and, and starting out, I began to look at the research and identify significant gaps in post-homicide research. In particular, looking at the fact that research on homicide uh, particularly focuses on the victim and the perpetrator, not necessarily the survivor. Research on African, Caribbean, and Black survivors of homicide victims was limited relevant to their experiences, both individual and community and collectively, their coping strategies, the impact of experiencing the homicide more than two times in their lifetime, on their mental, physical, and spiritual well-being, and their service utilization patterns. And also beginning with that information, beginning to develop culturally responsive programming uh, to intervene. So in the beginning of my work, I began to simply ask the questions of black survivors of homicide victims, conduct qualitative exploratory studies that really said, ask uh, survivors, what is your experience surviving the homicide of a loved one? What supports did you utilize? Uh, what were the responses of grief for black survivors and homicide victims? And ultimately, how did they cope with the murder of their loved ones? So what became clear to me was the importance of uplifting the social cultural context of these experiences, really understanding what are the factors that are influencing what black survivors of homicide victims viewed as hurtful and helpful and how does that process manifest? In-depth interviews really allowed for me to hear what African-American survivors of homicide victims were saying about the influence of who they are, the obstacles that they face, and the impact of these experiences on coping with the homicide of a loved one. Through this process, I was able to better understand the social and cultural context that influenced the manner in which African-American survivors of homicide victims experience the homicide of loved one and identify resources, resources to cope with it. The first domain I identified was cultural trauma. Alexander and Ho refer to cultural trauma to describe the experiences of being oppressed, marginalized, and disenfranchised based upon one's racial and or ethnic status. And so the following themes by, identified by Black survivors, African-American survivors of homicide victims fall under that domain. The first being ancestral survivorship. I just have confidence in African-Americans ability to be a people and understand from whence we came and understand how much baggage we've been able to destroy or clean up or whatever it is that we've had to deal with that I don't think we were born to bear. I believe the ability of my people to overcome so many things, so so much and so many things and still have not truly, in my opinion, arrived at first class recognition by many, many people. We are still, I think, some of the greatest achievers there are. This is Margaret, a surviving grandparent. Also under the domain of cultural trauma was this theme of anticipated hardship. I'm trying to make sure that you understand that one of the reasons for me, and I dare say the majority of African-Americans and people of color the reason we keep things to ourselves is life is supposed to have a little bit of pain. You know, no sunshine without the rain. We grew up with those kind of anecdotes that make us hold things in. This is Elaine, a surviving aunt, who is really talking about, again, because of uh, anti-Black racism, that we anticipate that there's going to be hardship. I want you to keep your eyes on Elaine the surviving aunt, and we'll circle back to her in a moment. So what became clear in, in my interviews were that, again, under the domain of, of, of cultural trauma, there was uh, 
anticipated um, uh, hardship and ancestral survivorship. And then a homicide occurs. And what African-American survivors of homicide victims described was a, a culture, a culture of homicide that is altogether unique to their experience that I deem culture of homicide. Shame and stigma were the themes that fall under this. I try to cope now by not being ashamed to talk about it because I was ashamed to talk about it, especially being African-American and the stereotypes of African-Americans that we are just prone to this. And even now, and you know, like every time I tell people this, not every time, I'm exaggerating now a bit here, but someone says, you know, oh, is it drug related? Like that is the first thing that pops out of their mouths. This is Malik, a surviving cousin who talks about sort of the stereotypes and of interaction with neighbors and police about what happened to uh, his cousin. Blame under the culture of homicide. I question whether or not there was something I could have done to keep him out of this environment. And therefore perhaps this never would have occurred. So I guess I'm saying in some sense, I'm always questioning whether or not I'm partially or a bit somehow responsible for his tragic death. This is Elaine, a surviving aunt who described her nephew who would come to visit every summer. And the one summer he didn't come to visit was the summer that he was murdered. This is a common theme that I've heard over and over again from several black survivors of homicide victims. Lack of justice. I remember my brother was like, we all know who did it. And they, the problem is the police aren't doing anything about it. My brother was like, I know who it is, you know, we all know who it is because my cousin was apparently not the right target. It is unsolved and we just feel like they, meaning the police, don't care. So what African-American survivors of homicide victims were telling me is that there's this nuance just by being black, this nuanced experience of cultural trauma, and that when a homicide occurs, they enter into a realm of cultural homicide where there were unique uh, sort of experiences that happened to them. The work of Lazarus and Folkman helped to explain some of what was happening. A stressor, homicide occurs, and survivors appraise the stressor to determine what coping strategies will be utilized to manage the stressor. And yet for African-American survivors of homicide victims, it didn't appear to be that simple. My good friend and colleague came up with the term racial appraisal, which really helped to explain that Contrary to Lazarus and Folkman that indicate that someone experiences a stressor, they appraise that stressor and determine whether I'm gonna use emotion or problem-focused coping. That African-American survivors of homicide victims were racially appraising that experience to be able to uh, assess available resources uh, to help them in coping uh, with the homicide of a loved one. Racial appraisal suggests that for black people, disenfranchised, marginalized populations, racial appraisal consists of both culture and structure. Culture is a set of shared attitudes and beliefs about the way things should be done. And it is crucial to how people perceive and cope with trauma. Structure shapes those perceptions in that it dictates the distribution of resources. Race is a component of our social structure that allocates material goods and services, social and psychological resources unevenly throughout the United States for black people. Racialized populations like African-Americans appraise stressful encounters and assess coping resources based upon this paradigm. As a result, Survivors shared with me through this lens their coping strategies. Spiritual coping. My grandmother used to say, if you have a problem, take it to God. She didn't say take it to the therapist. This is Elaine, surviving on. Keep your eyes on Elaine. Main, meaning, meaning making. I believe in God, but to a certain extent, because I don't think God takes an innocent baby or a person that good that wants to help the world. So I keep telling myself, he probably needs an under, another angel now. 
This is Langston, age 18, surviving cousin who was really trying to make sense of it. And again, he is not unlike many survivors I, I, I've spoken with who, who talk about relying upon their faith, their spirituality to make sense uh, of, of such horror. Maintaining a connection to the deceased. I try to cope with it by maintaining a personal connection with him, meaning like having conversations with him. Sometimes when things get difficult or remembering that I don't want anybody else to have to deal with that kind of thing that I did. So I almost talk to him or pray to him to get through not only the grief that I feel regarding his loss, but also to get through and do the work that I need to do. This is Trinity, a surviving cousin who also happens to be a social worker and was processing her grief journey uh, and trying to really unpack that um, in her efforts to be of assistance uh, to others who were going through the same thing. Collective coping and caring. I really focused on what my family was going through rather than what I was going through. I was really like, what do you need? How do we get this together? So in many ways, that was my coping mechanism by not dealing with it in many respects. So I focused my energies on helping other people. Again and again, a very, very common theme when I'm speaking uh, with Black survivors of homicide victims. But the reality is, and, and this may not be new news, uh, Nancy Boyd Franklin and Pinder Hughes all talk about, uh, you know, the black families and how they band together collectively to, to help with all types of stressors. But for homicide victims over and over again in, in my conversations with them, it's typically one or two individuals within that family structure that are paying for the funeral, flying aunts and cousins and uncles into the funeral, uh, paying for the repass. So they're coping collectively, and this one, these one or two people are helping individuals in the family, but who's helping them? So again, while collective coping is well-documented in African-American family literature, this is something that was um, consistently coming up for Black survivors of homicide victims. Concealment. I think I tend to internalize and find a small part of my heart or a small part of my mind, an actual small closet in my heart or small closet in my mind to shut up those things that bother me. I don't know if you remember the movie, The Godfather. There's a line in The Godfather where Michael says to his younger brother, you never speak against family. You never disagree with the family. You never go outside of the family. And I think that is just kind of my mantra. I'm just not of the belief that you go outside the home to garner assistance with family or personal problems. This is Elaine surviving on, remember I told you to keep your eye on Elaine. Elaine also shared with me that uh, diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, and smoked about a pack and a half of cigarettes a day. So what does it mean for the physical, not only mental, but physical well-being of individuals who experience chronic cumulative black death? and conceal it for fear of judgment because they feel blame. What, what does that do? Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a grant uh, that I still need to unearth because it didn't get funded, but uh, to really, really uh, look at this, it's something that we, we definitely need to, to examine that correlation. So when we think about, again, uh, cultural trauma, uh, the culture of homicide and the interaction, the transactional relationship between these two constructs, uh, what began to emerge was this model of coping for African-American survivors of homicide victims that were saying to me that when I wake up and because of anti-Black racism and I will experience hardship, I will experience trauma, and then a homicide occurs, oftentimes not once, not twice, but three times in their lifetime, that these traumas uh, impact uh, the manner in which they assess and cope uh, with and identify resources to cope with this um, horrific tragedy. So with this understanding, there are a few implications for research and policy 
and practice. What became clear to me is as far as research, that it was imperative that we continue to create uh, pathways to collaborate and uplift the voices of black survivors of homicide victims. And I firmly believe that that has to be done for and with and partnership with community. Uh, that we have a responsibility to develop culturally responsive tools of measurement that capture the uh, multiple traumas that black people, black survivors and homicide victims in, um, experience in order to identify uh, and, and, and create uh, programs that can help them cope with the murder. Um, and then also we have to begin to explore the experiences of black survivors of homicide victims throughout the, the global diaspora. My work here in Toronto is beginning to unpack uh, some of that in terms of the African Caribbean black experience uh, and some interesting preliminary data is coming out of that, but we've got to be, we understand the, the, the magnitude, the ripple effect across country borders that black people experience wherever they are, they disproportionately experience homicide. We have a responsibility to, to uplift and examine those nuances. Uh, policy, um, we have to do better in not just collecting uh, race-based data here in Canada, but when we have an opportunity, um, and I'm also, I'm going to be very candid, I'm referring to the recent report from the FBI, that talked about the increase uh, in homicide during 2020, um, there, there was a huge gap in that reporting um, because the, the reality for black people is that it's been at an all time high um, and really looking at who has historically been impacted. And so we, we have to do better, not only collecting the data, but reporting it and also making it accessible to communities. I think there's a missed opportunity as well to, to capture the trauma histories. Time and time again, I'm asked to do trainings with teachers and medical residents. And I think they're missed opportunities. I think about the days with um, when, when intimate partner violence, uh, tools of measurement were being implemented. Uh, primary care physicians were being trained and asked to collect that data for caregivers that were coming in with their children for back to school wellness checks. Why can't we be doing the same when we think about capturing the trauma histories so that, that when that child is, is sitting at their desk and, and the student uh, or, or they're diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, we really begin to understand that just two weeks ago, they experienced the murder of their uncle or their cousin. Um, so those are just some of the ideas in terms of making that policy, in terms of doing that creatively and innovatively and mandating that. Um, I think about practice. I think about the fact that we must, programs and interventions must be more culturally responsive uh, in their approach. We have to think about the social cultural context that black survivors or homicide victims are, are telling us that they experience multiple traumas, the multiple traumas of anti-Black racism and the traumas of being chronically exposed to homicide. And so we have to position ourselves with that framework to better be able to respond to their needs. Um, training uh, of clinical and other professionals. I think we think about training on how to respond to the needs of Black survivors of homicide victims of their faith-based community, EMTs, medical examiners. I mean, the opportunities are endless, particularly when we think about who that survivor is coming in contact with and how can we help augment that system to better be able to respond. So the absence of acknowledging chronic and cumulative black death obstructs our ability to comprehend and respond appropriately to the traumatic impact homicide has on family members and friends of homicide victims. Moreover, neglecting to acknowledge the chronic overrepresentation of black homicide victims is yet another form of victimization. Truly valuing black lives requires engagement and thorough assessment and candid conversations about the root causes 
and consequences of homicide for black communities. The Center for Research and Innovation for Black Survivors of Homicide Victims was established so that we can respond to these formative risks through the advancement of culturally responsive research, policy, and practice designed to meet the needs of Black survivors of homicide victims. Our vision is to develop culturally responsive approaches for Black survivors of homicide victims throughout our global communities. Our mission is to reduce service inequities for and with Black survivors of homicide victims through the advancement of collaborative interdisciplinary culturally responsive research and impactful policy and practice. Our values are rooted in equity from the community with the community, embrace and drive change, create sustainable opportunities for communities, cultural humility, passion and determination, and adopting culturally responsive approaches in everything that we do. I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my amazing team at the crib who make sure that we elevate the work and also our faculty affiliates that consist of uh, over 54 faculty members, both in Canada and the US who see themselves in the work, see the potential possibility of working across disciplines to meet the unmet needs of black survivors of homicide victims. Our current funding streams that we've received funding from the University of Toronto's Post Provost Office and the Division of University Advancement, uh, Federal SHRC uh, Insight Grant, the Anti-Racism Directorate uh, of Ontario, the US Department of Justice, as well as the University of Maryland School of Social Work. As a result of that funding, I just want to share with you a few innovative ways we've been able to uh, respond to the needs of Black survivors of homicide victims. I'm happy to announce that uh, just last week, we launched a uh, homicide tracker uh, here, which basically is a interactive GIS map that focuses on narrowing in on the experiences of uh, homicide victims or where homicides occur throughout Toronto, mapping that with, again, remember race-based data is not collected. So mapping it out, mapping over the overlay of um, uh, Afri predominantly African Caribbean and black neighborhoods using census data to look at different um, aspects of those neighborhoods in terms of income, uh, housing, so forth and so on, as well, again, as using Toronto Police Services data to uh, tell a little bit about uh, the nature of the homicide, and then actually looking at where in proximity to where the homicides occur and the neighborhoods occur, where are those grief and bereavement supports and services? With this mapping, we were allowed to, we were able to sort of uplift, uplift the disparity uh, in terms of where the services are, but really amplify uh, the experience, what's happening uh, in predominantly black neighborhoods relevant to homicide. The other portion of, of this project is uh, what we call the social determinants of homicide where we've identified, uh, not, unlike, um, what's, uh, not unlike what we're seeing with, with COVID, that those neighborhoods that are hardest hit with, by homicide also experience tremendous disparity in terms of education and income inequality. We also have the Invisible Wounds Project, which is the first project of its kind here in Canada. Uh, funded by the Shirk Insight Grant, where we're actually uh, um, conducting focus groups with African Caribbean and Black survivors of homicide victims throughout the Toronto area, with the second portion of that particular project resulting in digital storytelling. Uh, and so I'm really excited to, to see the evolution of that work. The Survivors of Homicide Victims, uh, Survivors of Homicide Victims and Mental Health Project, where we partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Association to again launch the first project wherein we conducted focus groups with African Caribbean and Black, Indigenous and racialized survivors of homicide victims and their service providers to better understand their experiences for the purpose of developing a post-homicide pedagogy that will inform a training, but also to understand what kinds of policies should be implemented. And so out of that particular project or 10 policy recommendations, which we intend to develop into policy briefs and training, the inventory of stress and coping for African-American survivors of homicide victims, where out of that macaws of model, I developed a tool of measurement 
uh, stay tuned for news about the publication. But that tool of measurement is really designed to help service providers understand that the experiences of anti-Black racism that is traumatic and the experiences of homicide, how that has shaped what sort of coping strategies African-American survivors of homicide victims uh, identify as hurtful and helpful for the purpose of helping that service provider uh, include those in, in, the, in their continuity of care. 30 at 830 Instagram series where you might be able to squint your eyes and see someone very familiar who was a special guest, uh, Dr. Patton, where for 30 minutes, every Wednesday, Wednesday night on Instagram, we hold the space to have candid conversations about the impact of structural inequities that are inherently structurally violent on black survivors of homicide victims. We talk about issues of mass incarceration, COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really enjoy that. Uh, and then um, many of you are probably familiar with this. I've worked with um, uh, some of your colleagues uh, and a colleague at um, Fordham University who developed the uh, police encounter survey. We were able to produce several publications out of that really beginning to look at what are the encounters, uh, what are the experiences of individuals uh, who have encounters with the police. So some of that work uh, has resulted in several uh, seminal publications, uh, again, designed to help us carve a pathway forward to begin to think about ways, innovative ways we can begin to support black survivors of homicide victims on their grief journey. And so when I think about that trajectory, when I think about the body of work, I recognize we've done a lot, but there's still so much more to do. Our pathway forward requires us to understand that our response to the pandemic of grief that injures the soul must be as vast as its impact. And so we have to think about interdisciplinary and international responses that we can develop to begin to hold the space for black survivors of homicide victims throughout the diaspora. We have to think about how can we train, better train victim services to be able to position themselves, to, to be able to respond to the needs of black survivors of homicide victims in a culturally responsive manner. We have yet to see the impact of the disproportionate reality of losing loved ones to COVID while simultaneously losing loved ones to homicide, violence, and victimization. We have yet to see the impact of that on their mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. So we have to begin to unpack that as well. Um, also expressions of grief, um, uh, again, through Dr. Patton's work that I, I, I um, often refer to, um, we're beginning to see how individuals as they're sheltering in place are navigating uh, technology, using technology to support one another uh, as they grieve. And so we have to be able to look at sort of the, the differences and nuances, uh, again, across different uh, community groups uh, and, and, and really begin to look at that um, perhaps internationally. Um, we have to begin to also, I think there's an opportunity to look at um, the expressions of grief and coping strategies if the murder is solved versus unsolved. And I also think we've got to be able to look at the homicide typology. Uh, was the, did the homicide, was it intrafamiliar homicide? Was it intimate partner violence homicide? Was it a stranger? We've got to be able to look at that as well and how that has an impact or not on, on someone's grief journey, coping strategies, et cetera. Wow. So um, I was going quickly because I thought I was going to run out of time. But um, in conclusion, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you for the invitation. But also thank the Black survivors of homicide victims who uh, honor me every day with their stories of survivorship. Thank you. <laughs>
Hello, hello. Dr. Sharp, you did it again. I am just, I'm sitting here with like chills because I so appreciate the way in which you honor our communities. Um, I appreciate the ways in which you situate this issue of gun violence and survivorship within a cultural context that allows the multiplicity of experiences to come through, for us to connect with stories and real people, for it to not be this disconnected experience and conversation. And I really appreciated how you took us along the journey with Elaine, that you located it within a, within a person that could be our aunt, our mother, our grandmother, our coworker, and allowed us to go deeper um, that, that, that important qualitative tradition of really kind of getting to know a person, understanding a full story. Um, you just paint a really um, critical picture and a hopeful picture. Um, and I'm so grateful for your work. So thank you for that. Thank you. There are tons of questions for oh. you, as you might imagine. <laughs> there's, lot, there's lots of excitement. Um, let's, so go, let's, let's go. Let's jump in. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad I get to return the favor <laughs> for our last conversation. <laughs> so, so, Dr. Sharp, what's working? What, what are the interventions and strategies that are successful mm. in supporting Black folks who are, mm. who are survivors of homicide, um, homicide victimization? You know, I'm... I'm of the belief that if you just listen to the community, they will tell you what they need, how they need it, period, full stop. And so I'm gonna start there with some of the, the most successful interventions, prevention strategies I've seen have been grassroots initiatives that always at the end of the fiscal year are, are fighting or struggling to, to, for sustainability. I'm thinking about in particular, some of the work that I've done with Safe Streets in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, the canvassing of neighborhoods with credible messengers who are either directly from the communities or you know, have directly been involved in a, in a, in a, in a life of, of crime, turn their lives around and, and really have legit relationships with folks. Um, and they canvass the neighborhoods you know, from the hours of, of 10 to 2 a.m., but their, their phones are going off and something's about to go down. And they're able to position themselves and go spaces and places that that you know, social workers, nurses, EMTs can't go. Um, and I've watched them and, and been privy to, to the ways in which they operationalize interventions, but it's with this understanding of who folks are and just candid conversations. And so some of those interventions I think um, ha have been the most successful. I also think if you think about social determinants of health, I mean, um, homicide, and you think about uh, structural inequity, um, when you think about the violent nature of depriving someone from food, clothing, shelter, and housing, those interventions that provide resources for individuals to have jobs, to have adequate housing as a means of preventing violence and attached to a brief trauma program, those types of programs, I think, have been the most successful in moving the needle and intervening, in intervening and stopping the violence um, before it occurs. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You know, as we, as we approach Black History Month, it's always an important time to look back as well to think about historical context. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we have is, what is the relationship, if any, does the leg the legacy of chattel slavery in the U.S. contribute to the homicide rates and the manner in which the descendants of slaves in the U.S. define and cope with this experience? Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> um, I, that, is, that is what I mean. Um, when I talk about training folks to be culturally responsive in their practice, I, I recently gave a presentation and I I remember seeing the faces of people and they were like, what? Because I basically said to them, um, we train social workers to not have assumptions. Don't make any assumptions. Meet the client where the client's at. I said, I'm actually going to counter that. I want you to have some assumptions. I want you to have the assumption that when a Black person enters your office, even if they don't know racism, racism knows them. And so the the historical residue of slavery 
is always there. It, it, is, it, is the, it has fed into the fabric of our society. And so anti-Black racism, uh, slavery, the abuse, the intergenerational transmission of trauma is always there. With, I need us to ground ourselves in that understanding of that trauma. And then we can unpack the sexual assault, the homicide, the abuse, what, but that is always connected um, and, and informing us whether we're keenly aware of it or not. And so to that, I say it, it is always there. And I think we as clinicians and service providers really do a disservice when we don't understand the, the, the magnitude of the trauma from, from that vantage point and how it's impacting and navigates and plays a role in how we see, view the world, uh, you know, view, view something as hurtful or helpful, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the historical perspective here is always at play and it and reminds me of why, you know, these, these conversations about critical race theory are, are, are so heightened in this space because it forces us to reckon with where we are and who we are as a country. And I think lots of folks are not ready or afraid to go there, but it seems to be a critical element of, of how we're actually going to treat this issue of violence as an yeah. epidemic in the U.S., but that that fear of, of of going there is really striking to me. See, because the reality is that we have to be there mm. as people, mm-hmm. right? We 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 have don't have a choice. So mm. the idea that someone can choose is, mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. great is problematic mm-hmm. within itself. So yeah. Um, yeah. That's a whole nother seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We could spend a whole nother hour on that. Oh my gosh. Right. Um, our, our next question is, in communities acclimated to metabolizing trauma, is this anticipated hardship a defense mechanism to preventing violence or preemptive coping mecha- mechanism to what is seen as inevitable violence? Mm. Mm. That's a great question. Yeah. Again, I, this is just my, my, my perspective. I think that it anticipated hardship. Um, it, I'm trying, I'm gonna give a very concrete example. And I think mo- most folks here can probably relate uh, or at least heard of or relate to. It's the, the talk that we have with um, our children, black children about what do you do when you're pulled over by a police officer? Don't put your hoodie on, don't walk here, don't want that. It's, it's this anticipation because we live in a race, uh, a racist society um, where day after day, black people experience racism, we anticipate that there's going to be harm. So it does, I think, um, anticipated hardship, that information act as data that we utilize to be able to cope, anticipate the threat that's coming. Um, it's interesting some of the wording that was utilized in, in, in the question um, in terms of, um, I think it was metabolized. Yes. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I think it, it has, it, it, it's, if we just look at the events of, of just a year ago, we understand that that, that that way of being, of navigating a system is almost necessary for our, our survival. So it, it is in, in, our, in our DNA. Yeah. But I also think about how researchers have documented this, right? In the form of hypervigilance. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of those things are very true. So then again, I say, what does it do to your mental wellness mm-hmm. and health to be at that that state, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I do think it's it anticipated. It's a way that I um, may use that to 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 navigate, to 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 cope. Um, you know, with the the um, anticipation of, of what might be coming. Yeah, you know, one one of I really appreciate this term of anticipated hardship. And one of the spaces in which I'm really concerned about is spaces that are po- that are supposed to be safe, 
and they're supposed to be helpful. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, you know, a few years back, I did interviews with uh, survivors at um, a hospital in Chicago mm-hmm. and the patients on their on their bed knew that they would not be treated well in the hospital yeah. and had anticipated that their experience would be harmful. And these are people that are trying to cope with a bullet still lodged in their body. Okay. And they knew that the social worker and the doctor and the nurse were not going to treat them well in the hospital and that they would not get the support and resources that they needed once they left the hospital either in order to recuperate and to survive and to thrive. Mm-hmm. And so I think these, these spaces, these locations mm-hmm. of anticipated hardship also need to be understood and impact, mm-hmm. unpacked further as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. I was speaking with a, uh, a colleague of yours earlier, and we were talking about the difference between coping versus uh, uh, adapting. And it was mm-hmm. a, a very good conversation that I'm hoping we can continue. Yeah. Because uh, I think that there's a, there's a almost a, almost a spectrum mm-hmm, mm, that's mm-hmm. happening here that I, I have yet to unpack. So I, I just want to, again, thank them for that gift. Yeah, absolutely. We have another question here. Do you think the chronic exposure and mass proliferation of Black trauma, both through videos of Black death on social media and common narratives seen in film and art, have brought meaningful attention on inequalities or further desensitized people to Black pain? It's a really good question. Hmm. I, can't, I didn't catch that last part. Further, uh, further desensitized people to Black pain. Mm-hmm. So, so are we just used to seeing Black people murdered? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, um, mm. you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm getting information. I mean, sorry, I, I, I remember looking at both sides of this coin from folks saying, you know, we are, um, you know, glorifying mm. the murder of, of black bodies. At the same time, um, we in black communities know someone who knows someone if it hasn't been personally have been personally affected by homicide and so what the world the world got a front row seat for nine minutes and 28 seconds to what we know (sighs) is our reality yeah and something fundamental shifted now we have not overcome and by any means or whatever but i think um that there was something to that, um, that pinnacle moment. Um, even I personally um, was changed in, in, the, in the way in which I enter space, what I say and how I do, and really had to check in about um, had I normalized mm-hmm. doing this work, you know, chronic cumulative black death yep. in a way that for my own almost uh, survivorship, right? Um, so I, I have, I, I'm, 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 I'm of the ilk that that there is a way in which those moments where our murders have been caught on tape Mm -hmm. is allowing other individuals to see for a moment in time what has been a historical traumatic impact yeah yeah for us and i and i i I, I don't know i i think i think that there's something there to that in terms of at least opening the door for people to begin to understand it um even though we've been talking about it for for quite some time i don't know it's it's so hard to unpack because it's such a dehumanizing moment right Mm -hmm. and like how do like how do you measure the moment within Mm. a dehumanizing process and space like you think back to the folks on the edmund pettus bridge in which, Mm -hmm. which in the 60s folks watched them get beaten did it move them did it move them the the movement Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Was it w- was it a critical kind of reflection piece for the U.S.? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But why do we have to watch Black people be be beaten 
why, why do we why, yeah. why do we have to like why do we have to go there yeah. and, and so it, it feels like it, like yes <laughs> there's movement yes it is a way of documenting process and then yes it is painful as hell and we shouldn't have to see it or experience it shouldn't it. have to go there it shouldn't, have, shouldn't to have to go there yeah 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 uh wow well, yeah it's a really good question um w- one of the things that came out of your interviews was uh spirituality mm-hmm. but in social work we you know we get really funny about spiritual conversations we don't like to talk about spirituality we don't like to focus on it we get really kind of uh, when mm-hmm. it comes up but do we need to change that conversation in social work? Should, should spirituality be more of an imperative within the social work paradigm and framework? Mm-hmm. I think if we're not taking a, a holistic vantage point of the, the, the whole being that walks into the space, then we're doing it a service. And if that whole being is saying, my spirituality, my religion, my practice, my faith is important to me, you know, we, we have a responsibility to enter the space that way. You know, it, I, one of the things in Canada uh, that they do very well here is they uh, acknowledge the manner in which indigenous folks mm. enter the space from a holistic standpoint, um, a, a connection to, to, the, to the earth, um, the connection to the spirit and the body, that that is not, they're not separate entities. And so I think that we have to, to begin to practice through our, our research and practice and policy in that same way, if we're truly gonna be culturally responsive to the, to the needs uh, of black survivors of homicide victims. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there's a question here about any experience that you may have had with the Latino community, any similarities and differences in terms of um, uh, coping and expression here. Mm-hmm. Thank you for the question. I have not um, delved into the research in depth um, with Latino populations, but I will say this, that uh, we all know that the, the data says that um, it indicates that uh, African-Americans in the U.S. Uh, experience, uh, disproportionately experience the homicide of a loved one, and then Latinos are, are the, the, the second population. I have a great colleague who's doing work uh, around Latino day laborers, and we were talking about how they um, also experience homicide and theft Mm-hmm. Uh, because they often don't aren't putting money in banks and so they're robbed when they get paid going from different sort of jobs so forth and so on and what does that do particularly when you're not reporting right because you're you're fearful that you you might be deported mm-hmm. so there's a whole lot of complexity i think throughout the the um the Latino populations um, that has really is an opportunity to to impact that as well. But I have not um, I have not uh, d- conducted research. With that yeah, particular yeah, thing. really good points there. I think the, the mm-hmm. I, I've I've done some work in this area, and the critical difference was the immigration status piece. But there were so many other similarities that I th- it felt like. Um, a missed opportunity to really dig in to how, you know, building strong collaborative spaces around Black and and Latinx communities could really perhaps produce new approaches, new findings, new ways of coping that I think um, would really be really helpful. So I feel like this is a really important space to to, um, jump into. Um, going back to this historical question, we were talking about slavery earlier. The question for you around how, how do your findings relate to the uh, theory of post-traumatic slave syndrome and how, how does or might your research respond to community members um, and, and how they uh, relate uh, to this concept of post-traumatic slave syndrome? Mm. I, my answer will probably be short and sweet. I think when you think about the number of times on average, black people will experience the homicide of a loved one. Um, there is no post. Mm. There's no post. Mm. And when we think about the manner in which we constantly are exposed to anti-black racism, mm. 
are we really free? Mm. So <laughs> where I stand, <laughs> where you went I, there. You went there. Okay. I did, I mean, where I sit, there, there, there really is no post, and that is. I'm actually getting chills because that's really frightening. Um, it's frightening. So I don't. When I think about, you know, a grief journey, and that. Oftentimes when I'm speaking um, with black survivors of homicide victims, you know, it occurs to me that in the telling of the stories that they experience the murder of their cousin and before they have a chance to catch their breath, they're also experiencing a murder of a neighbor. There is no post. And when you think about again, the issue of anti-black racism that is trauma is always at that backdrop, I don't necessarily know if there's a, a post, mm. if you will. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go right there. Yeah, like you're, you're reminding me of like why we, why we have to say things like Black grief, right? Because other people may say, we, we know a lot about grief. We understand the stages and the processes. Mm -hmm. and lots of history and lots of data in this space. But what you're reminding me of this element of the, again, what you've been talking about this whole time was the collective trauma, the history of trauma that is just pervasive and connected. But oftentimes I find hard to language. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's, it's, it's an emotion, it's an observation, it's an experience, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's, in a, it's relational. Yeah. And I feel like all, all of these pieces are so critical and are also emblematic of Black grief. Yeah. Um, and this is why we need to study it in depthly and have more robust processes for understanding how these expressions come to come to play out. So, and 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 what is the manner in which we hold the space for the expression mm. of, of of grief? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, the backdrop of anti-black racism, the homicide. So, how are we holding holding the space for that grief? And oftentimes, I don't think we hold it. Yeah, we don't hold it properly we don't get angry or, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I'm not understanding why we're still talking about this. I'm sorry, like, you know, so, so how are we holding the space for that um, to, to really fully breathe and manifest is, is also a part of the complexity uh, of structural inequality and how we respond, so. And, and how can we hold it if it's misunderstood? Right. Mm -hmm. So you, you you talked about like this, like getting angry. Right. And this is something mm -hmm. that comes up a lot in my work is that mm -hmm. anger is a natural response. It is a it is a natural emotion. And yet, it, as it relates to black grief, it is misunderstood and oftentimes deemed threatening and aggression, and aggressive and problematic and bad. Right. And so the question here, I think is a really important one is like, mm -hmm. how do you think about the narratives of the angry black woman and the strong black woman that are linked to reactions of black homicidal victimization, right? So how do we think about how we talk about the black woman experience as it relates to how they're reacting uh, to victimization in the community? And I think it goes back to exactly what we're talking about, right? I think it's understanding the, the, the trauma of not being free the trauma of anti-Black racism and how that says that you dictates you have to show up in this particular setting, in this particular way. And then to not acknowledge to through, through the, the lack of race-based data collection, the lack of reporting by the FBI when they do report homicide, the lack of response. By, so you have this, this sort of constant um, this constant sort of bumping up against um, at different points of traumatic experiences. And, and we don't couch the expression of grief if that person is angry, we, we label it. That's another form of racism. We, we, we label it and, and dismiss it or um, you know, say it is uncivilized not recognizing the full experiences of that for informing that anger, yeah. the full experiences that they're exploring, uh, you know, informing that reaction. Yeah. Um, how can you possibly 
experience racism every single day in everything that you do yeah. and then experience not one not two but three family members and friends who've been murdered and not have some sort of reaction <laughs> right um so you know those narratives those those stereotypes and that labeling i think we have to think about where does it come from to be able yeah. to pack it and address it yeah yeah Ooh, there's so much work in this space um i want to take a, a a slight turn here and and talk about the perpetrator mm. um because oftentimes they are either omitted from the conversation or um, reduced in the conversation and I often i think we understand that oftentimes the perpetrator is the victim and vice versa yeah. so like what are your thoughts around the perpetrator as it relates to gun um gun violence survivorship um I mean, and yeah you literally just said it yeah. I think that we do not acknowledge and recognize that there's a victim and perpetrator overlap. Mm. And we really, I think we do a disservice to, to communities at large, but we do a disservice to, to, to individuals who sit in the, the complexity of both. Um, and, and it's very common. It, it, it's very common. But again, if we're not holding the space in a proper culturally responsive manner for grief to be expressed, yeah. right? For to have a, a space and place to understand and unpack all of that, yeah. then, then there's a higher likelihood that this cycle of violence will, will, will continue. You know, I think about um, a really interesting program that we were going to implement in Baltimore, but Actually, we did implement it, but then we had to to um, to not. It didn't go on because of the lack of funding. But um, it was really going into um, the prison system and capturing the trauma histories of individuals. Once you capture those trauma histories and those stories, to understand the multi the multiple uh, ways in which. Um, many of those who are incarcerated, uh, who look like you and I, who were, were victimized, you, 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 you really begin to understand what, what's happening and where we had moments, yeah. we had my moments to intervene. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really think that there's something, something to that, that we have to begin to, to, to unpack with, again, trauma history assessments, for sure. That is so critical. And I see it time and time again on social media. You know, I, I've studied one young Black girl for seven years. And the reality was that she cried out over and over and over again. She expressed her victimhood on Twitter over and over again. And then over time, that victimhood changed the perpetrator. We watched it. We watched the language shift. We watched the emoji shift. We watched the video shift. So, so there was really all these critical moments, but again, the way in which she languished her experiences was not immediately understood as being grief, as okay. being trauma, as being coping, as being reaching out. And so we're missing opportunities because honestly, you know, and I, I look at myself as well, I was imbibing white toxic interpretations of Black people, mm -hmm. of Black girls, and it influenced what I saw, what I read, mm -hmm. and how I understood her. Mm -hmm. um, so we got to, we, we, we have to be able to identify these, um, some of the challenges in the space. Yeah. And the other, I'm thinking about the, my experience in Baltimore when Freddie Gray was murdered. And I, I will never forget when, um, you know, everyone wanted to have these conversations about the Baltimore uprising. Mm why were folks so angry and destroying their own neighborhood? And I said, I, I, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, let's, let's pull back. Let's take a moment. First of all, we're not gonna call those young men and women thugs. Um, we're, we're not um, going to, to do that because this, the, these systems and structures have, that we work in have also done harm. Let, yeah. Let's acknowledge that. Um, and let's 
think about the moments where we didn't respond as an organizational entity, where communities were crying out for help. And I'm not in any way condoning violence, but I am saying, let's unpack what is happening because now you've sold me that you're not paying attention. But if I do this, yeah. you are going to pay attention in some way, shape or form, acknowledge the constant sort of uh, thing that's going on in communities. So, uh, you know, I, I do, I really think that we have to begin to look at that for sure. Um, we are approaching time. I have one more question for you. Um, what is the responsibility of non-Black folk in this space, mm -hmm. right? As, as we grapple with um, wokeness mm -hmm. and liberalism and, you know, um, um, a performance of allyship in this space, what, what is the true responsibility mm -hmm. of non-Black folk here? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start off with a softer, gentle approach and then end in, in sort of a call to action. Um, you know, I think to, to listen when someone tells you they've been harmed, believe them. And I think on the latter side of the spectrum, I've, I've moved from allyship to accomplices. Mm -hmm. What are you willing to do? Mm -hmm. What are you willing to give up to ensure the survival of your Black colleagues, neighbors, friends, community? To really take a sort of inventory, if you will. Yeah. Um, I think that's where we're at at this point. Um, you know, it really can no longer sort of be uh, sort of surface level performative because people are dying. Um, dying, black people are dying of COVID at disproportionate rates, homicide in the middle of COVID. So, so I think we really have to begin to, to think about um, how are we collectively going to get in some good trouble? Um, you know, and, and, and how are you going to keep ensuring that when we sit, allow ourselves to sit in the belly of discomfort, those are opportunities to grow. And that that kind of work and evolution of work doesn't happen overnight, but we must remain vigilant in doing it if we're going to make systemic change. Um, and it has to be done together. Dr. Sharp, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your work. I appreciate your thoughtfulness and your time with us this evening. Um, I really hope folks can check you out on Instagram. Your, your Instagram lives are always hot, amazing, exciting, thoughtful, lovely, um, just exactly what we need. Um, is there, a, there, there were other questions that we didn't get a chance to get to. Are there ways that people can contact you if they have other questions? Ah, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, oh, it's not up. Um, so uh, Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A dot sharp, S-H-A-R-P-E at utoronto.ca. Um, please send me emails. Um, you can also, I'm on Twitter. Ooh, I, now see, see? See, this is, I'm, I'm just going, no, nope, it's off. I'm also at Twitter, on Twitter. I think it's Dr. T Sharp. I think it's Dr. T Sharp. Uh, but yeah, please send me any questions you may have. And again, thank you all so much for inviting me to spend the evening with you. Thank really you. Much. I'm going to turn it back over to Dean Begg. I just, I have to say, I can't thank you enough for an absolutely riveting session. Riveting. Um, it, it has been, uh, you know, Dr. Patton for superb moderating and Dr. Sharp for your sharing of your fascinating work conducted as you reiterated for and with community, right? Mm -hmm. This is huge. And more than that, I wanna thank you for forcing us to confront the profound and visceral and lasting effects of homicide on, on black survivors. Uh, and, the, and the inordinate burden, again, borne by Black communities. Um, 
And, and finally, thank you for inviting and compelling us to feel our part in it and our responsibility to address it. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great evening.